Hi everyone, we're going into chapter 12, which is the second chapter of our nervous system unit. We're gonna go into screen sharing mode. Here's my PowerPoint. <laughs> and start with the um, spinal cord, looking closer at the spinal cord. So overall, the central nervous system includes the brain and the cranial nerves. We're gonna get on, into all of that in chapter 13. For right now, we're focusing on the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. So start with kind of baby steps, so to speak. The spinal cord is the simplest part of the central nervous system. It has a functional and structural relationship. It's pretty easy to understand, incoming, outgoing, pretty straightforward. The brain and spinal cord ultimately are receiving Sensory information from the receptors all over the body. They contain reflex centers and there's motor output to the effectors throughout the body as well. The majority of our nervous system functions are outside of our awareness. Things like reflexes, they can include uh, rapid automatic responses triggered by specific stimuli. There's spinal reflexes that are controlled in the spinal cord. They can function without input from the brain. So again, this is what we're focusing on in this chapter. Sensory receptors, getting information, sending it to the spinal cord, and then reflex centers in the spinal cord, providing some output to effectors like muscles, glands, and adipose. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. Let's talk about spinal cord structure. The adult spinal cord is about 18 inches long. Uh, it is actually shorter than the vertebral column, so it, it ends somewhere between L1 and L2. It's divided into 31 segments corresponding with the uh, vertebrae, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, one coccygeal segment. The spinal cord structure has gray matter, um, which is embedded in the white matter. Um, it has an expanded enlargement around the, uh, uh, in the cervical region and in the lumbar region. This, these cervical and lumbar enlargements are providing um, special nerves out to the shoulder and upper limbs or to the pelvis and lower limbs. The conus medullaris is a tapered cone-like structure to the distal end of our spinal cord. It's just inferior to the lumbar enlargement. It's kind of like the end of the spinal cord. The cauda equina is all the dorsal and ventral roots that are <coughs> branching off from that conus medullaris uh, along with the phylum terminale. Um, the term comes from its resemblance to a horse's tail. And the phylum terminale or phyl phylum terminale however you want to pronounce it, is the terminal thread. This is just a slim, slim, ten, I can't speak, a thin, slender strand of fibrous tissue that goes beyond that conus medullaris into the second sacral vertebrae. It provides longitudinal support. Um, so it's actually more of a, a tendon than a nerve. There it is. There's that phylum terminale that I was mentioning. Here's all of our cauda equina coming off, like spreading around like a horse's tail. Conus medullaris up here, this kind of end V-shaped structure, lumbar enlargement, cervical enlargement. Let's talk about the spinal nerves. There's 31 pair, as I mentioned. They are identified and associated by their associated vertebrae. So the cervical region comes off of the cervical vertebrae. Um, C1 is the spinal nerve that, are, that emerges between the skull and the first cervical vertebrae. So it's superior to the vertebrae. Um, they're also identified by the association with the adjacent vertebrae, so the thoracic and lumbar regions. Um, those spinal nerves emerge inferior to the vertebrae as opposed to the cervical, which are superior to the vertebrae. So T1 emerges first, uh, inferior to the first thoracic vertebrae. Here you see those spinal nerves coming out. Am I going to give you a diagram and ask you which nerve it is? No, not going to do that. It's not that important. Let's talk about the cross-sectional features and cross-sectional anatomy of the um, spinal cord. The superficial layer of the spinal cord is white matter. This is our largely dominated by myelinated and unmyelinated axons. Maxons, what's a maxon? Um, the deepest layer of our spinal cord is the gray matter. This is the majority of our cell bodies, neuroglia, and unmyelinated axons. It's just around a small area around the central canal it kind of forms like a butterfly shape in the middle. There are also cross-sectional features. There's a posterior median sulcus and an anterior median fissure. It's just a deeper groove on the anterior surface of our spinal cord. The spinal nerves are, are, are contain both motor and sensory input, so it's a mixed input. The ventral root contains the motor neurons and the dorsal root contains the sensory neurons and the ganglia of the sensory neurons are located outside of the spinal cord in something called the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion is um, 
located just off to the side of either uh, vertebral segment. And uh, again, the gangli a ganglion is a, is, is a cluster of cell bodies in the, in the peripheral nervous system. So it's outside of the central nervous system, even though we're talking about it with our spinal cord. Here it is. Here's our anterior median fissure. So this is the front. This is the back, posterior median sulcus. You can see that butterfly-shaped gray matter surrounded by white matter, all of our myelinated axons. This is the dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion, and ventral root with all of our motor pathways. They fuse just outside of the spinal cord to make that mixed nerve, which goes out to the periphery, sending and receiving signals. Pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. Moving on to the next section, spinal meninges. Meninges are specialized membranes or coverings that surround the spinal cord. They also surround the brain. They're actually continuous with the meninges that surround the brain. They provide physical stability, shock absorption, as well as hold the blood vessels in place, providing nutrients and oxygen for the spinal cord. It's continuous with the cranial meninges, as I've mentioned. And there's three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Let's talk about the dura matter. The dura matter is the outermost fibrous layer of the meninges. It's very tough, it has dense collagen fibers, and it has a very thin subdural space that separates the dura matter from the arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter is the middle meningeal layer and includes simple squamous epithelium, which makes up this arachnoid membrane. The subarachnoid space is where the cerebral spinal fluid circulates. It extends between the arachnoid membrane and the outer surface of the pia matter. The pia matter is the innermost, most delicate lining. It's a meshwork, meshwork of collagen and elastic fibers, and it's firmly bound to the underlying connective tissue or neural tissue. So in other words, if I was holding the spinal cord right here, which would be tricky because it had to saw off all the vertebrae to get just a spinal cord in my hands. But if I had just a spinal cord in my hands, the pia matter would be wrapped around the outside. It's tightly bound. You can almost never have a spinal cord without a pia matter on top of it. And there you see it. Pia matter, arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space, dura matter. So let's talk about that subarachnoid space. That subarachnoid space co contains arachnoid trabeculae. Trabeculae is just a network of collagen and elastic fibers uh, that are attaching that arachnoid matter to the pia matter. This subarachnoid space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. It acts as a shock absorber. It acts as a diffusion medium between um, the blood and the brain, allowing for gas, nutrients, and waste products to be exchanged without the blood and spinal cord actually having its own blood supply. The epidural space is between the dura matter and the walls of the vertebral canal. So it contains um, adipose tissue, blood vessels, a real art tissue. Um, it's just full of cushioning. The other surrounding structures include the intervertebral foramen, the dorsal root ganglion. Um, kind of sits between the pedicles of the adjacent uh, vertebrae and the spinal meninges are continuous with the connective tissue wrappings of the spinal nerves and peripheral branches, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So here you see kind of a cross section of the vertebral body, our transverse process here, spinous process, uh, the overall spinal cord. This is our ventral root, dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion, fusion of the spinal nerve here. We have all these rami, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and um, here are the meninges. The, menin the meningeal membranes are continuous with the connective tissue that surround each individual nerve fiber. So let's talk about some of those supporting ligaments that hold it all in place. They prevent lateral movement of the spinal cord. So when we are moving back and forth, our spinal cord is still staying tight in place. They're called dentinaculate ligaments. These extend from the pia matter through the arachnoid matter and the dura matter, so they're very sturdy. They pre also prevent superior and inferior movements. Um, there's special connections at the foramen magnum and the coccygeal ligaments at the sacrum, preventing those superior and inferior movements. Here you can see those dentinaculate ligaments. It's a cadaver. So a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap would be the procedure where you're actually withdrawing a sample of CSF. Uh, the needle is typically inserted into the subarachnoid space somewhere around the conus medullaris area um, or just below that area uh, because if you insert it above that area, then you, you could risk touching the spinal cord, damaging something, so they do it lower. So if anything, it would just be a nerve that they touch. This is just showing you the... Uh, needle for the lumbar puncture look at it going through Eek. all the way through crazy you can pause the video here go back and answer these three questions let's keep moving and shaking through here talk about the difference between gray matter and white matter 
The uh, gray matter is organized into horns. There's a posterior, a lateral, and an anterior. And there's one on either side. So there's two posterior, lateral, anterior. Here you see them. Uh, posterior, lateral, anterior. Our nuclei is a functional group of cell bodies inside the central nervous system. So it is, we call them ganglia when they were in the peripheral nervous system. We're going to call them nuclei when they're in our central nervous system. Uh, they're usually grouped by region. We call them sensory nuclei or motor nuclei. So the sensory nuclei are receiving sensory information. Motor nuclei are issuing commands to the peripheral effectors. The gray commissures are the little axons that cross back and forth on either side of that central canal. So again, here you see posterior lateral, anterior gray horns. You can see they contain the nuclei, somatic and visceral sensory, somatic and visceral motor. Motor is always on the front, sensory is always on the back, uh, and then the commissures in the middle. The white matter is arranged into columns. There's a posterior white column, a lateral white column, an anterior white column, and an anterior white commissure. Same idea. The white matter, these columns, are arranged into tracts. Tracts are basically the bundles of axons in the central nervous system. It's kind of like a nerve in the peripheral nervous system. It's the same thing, except it's only within the spinal cord or brain. It's relatively uniform in diameter. They're all myelinated, myelinated and they all propagate very, very quickly. All axons in a tract are relaying the same type of information in the same direction. So you have A sending tracts going up and D sending tracts going down. All of the A sending tracts are carrying sensory information, right? There's no motor information going to the brain. Your brain doesn't move. All the motor information is coming down from the brain, down from the central nervous system, descending. So here you can see all of the motor nuclei on the uh, anterior, all of the posterior is. Um, I'm just confused by those labels. They're, the motor nuclei are on the front. Not, oh, these are the, just the tracks. Tracks carrying that sensory information up. Yes, that's like confused here. This is sensory information of the leg, hip, trunk, and arm going up to the brain, and then all of the motor cues coming down from the brain down, down to those effectors. Sorry, I got confused for a second there. All right, you can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. Let's talk about a spinal nerve. As I mentioned, the um, dura mater is continuous with the connective tissues around the spinal nerves. Well, let's talk about those connective tissues. They're comparative to the connective tissues associated with muscle fibers. You have the epineurium, which is the outermost covering. It's a dense network of collagen fibers, very similar to the dura mater. The perineurium is the middle layer. It wraps around the fascicles. Fascicles are just bundles of axons, just like in muscles, right? We have bundles of muscle fibers. Arteries and veins actually go into the epineurium and branch here in the perineurium. The endoneurium is the innermost layer. This is a very delicate connective tissue surrounding individual axons. Capillaries here su supply oxygen and nutrients to the axons, to the Schwann cells, to the fibroblasts, to all of those special cells in those areas. So here you see. The overall spinal nerve, fusion of afferent and efferent fibers, the fascicles themselves surrounded by the perineurium, and then the endoneurium is surrounding the individual uh, nerve cells, and then the Schwann cells, because we're in the periphery, are surrounding the axons in myelinated cells. So they, this, the spinal nerves will then branch. After they form from the fusion of sensory and motor, they branch off in different directions called rainy or the singular is ramus. Some are carrying visceral motor fibers, some are carrying autonomic um, fibers, so they're all going to different areas with different uses. The thoracic and lumbar segments are going to carry output for the sympathetic nervous system. This is our fight or flight response. The dorsal ramus is innervating our joints, the muscles, the skin of the back. The ventral ramus is innervating structures of the upper and lower limbs, innervating ladder on anterior trunks, and then the communicating rami, um, it's a gray and white rami communicants, they represent or they present the thoracic and superior lumbar segments of the, um, or they're present in, where's my brain at? They're present in the, uh, the superior lumbar and thoracic segments of the spinal cord. They also contain the axons of the sympathetic neurons. Sorry, I must not have drank my coffee today. Here you see all of these things that I'm talking about. 
Ventral root carrying motor commands out. Dorsal root carrying sensory information in. Dorsal root ganglia and all the cell bodies. Here's our spinal nerve. The spinal nerve branches. Branches to the dorsal remus, ventral remus, and our remi communicans. Remi communicans is only present in that thoracic and lumbar area carrying the sympathetic ganglia to the peripheral effectors for that fight or flight response. So let's talk about something called a dermatome. A dermatome is a specific region of the skin that's monitored by a single pair of spinal nerves. C1 usually doesn't have a special branch uh, to the skin because it has a special role, but um, typically the face is not innervated by C1. It's, it's innervated by the facial nerve, cranial nerve number five. Anyways, uh, the boundaries of adjacent dermatomes can overlap. This is clinically important when you're determining the damage that has been done to one's spine or dorsal root ganglion. So loss of sensation or characteristic signs uh, of skin on that dermatome would help you with that. So again, just looking at where someone feels that input is going to um, determine which spinal nerve is affected. Shingles is a virus that actually affects the dorsal root ganglion. It's caused by the same herpes virus that causes chickenpox. It can produce a very painful rash and blisters. And the distribution of the shingles rash is going to correspond with the sensory nerve that it's associated with on, and its associated dermatome. So a person who's had chickenpox has an increased risk for developing shingles later on in life because the virus will remain dormant um, within the anterior gray horns. There's an unknown trigger for reactivation. There is a vaccine that was approved in 2006. I haven't got that vaccine yet. I did have chickenpox. Most people that are over 25 have had chickenpox. Most people that are under 25 have been vaccinated. About 25 years old is about the cutoff for when that vaccine was starting to become popular. But here you can see the shingles rash all along this one particular dermatome on this person's body. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. Let's keep talking about how spinal nerves are distributed throughout the body. They distribute motor commands. They motor commands are originated from one singular motor nuclei. The motor nuclei comes from the central nervous system. The brain, will, again, we'll get there. Uh, but ultimately, it travels along the ventral root of each spinal nerve, and the ventral root and dorsal root will then join to form the spinal nerve. The dorsal ramus carries commands to the, to the back, skeletal muscles, skin. The ventral ramus carries commands to basically everything else, the body wall, the limbs, ventral lateral body surface, etc. The white ramus communicans carries um, sympathetic um, commands, myelinated fibers. The gray ramus is unmyelinated fibers, and this is carrying information to smooth muscle and glands. The white and gray Ramy, Ramy together are known as the Ramy communicans or communicating branches, and the sympathetic nerve can contain preganglionic and postganglionic fibers. So here's the whole thing in action. And spinal nerve is the entire thing. Dorsal root is uh, where all of our information comes in, right? Um, and that's our, our sensory information coming in. Then all of our information is going to be sent out through motor commands. The motor commands, visceral motor nuclei or visceral motor commands are going to be initiated probably from the central nervous system in the brain, travel down these uh, tracks, descending tracks within the spinal cord, leave through that ventral root. Visceral motor nuclei are going to take the, um, this, is, this is the white of, uh, white ramy communicans, sympathetic ganglion, and go to maybe the preganglionic fibers of some type of abdominal viscera like the stomach or pancreas, right? Somatic nuclei are going to travel through a different route depending on where they are in the body. Muscles of the skin and back are going to go through the dorsal ramus. Muscles of the rest of the body, body wall and limbs, are going to go through the ventral ramus. Pretty straightforward. This is just a breakdown of those pathways. If you want to look at them step by step, you're more than welcome to. Let's talk about sensory information. Sensory information is collected from the peripheral structures. It's delivered to the sensory nuclei within the spinal cord. The sympathetic nerves are going to carry that sensory information to the visceral organs. The ventral ramus carries sensory information from the, I just said to the visceral organs, from the visceral organs. Oh my goodness, maybe I should just stop this lecture now. The sympathetic nerve carries sensory information from the visceral organs. The ventral ramus carries sensory information from the ventral lateral body surface, front sides. 
the body wall, and the limbs. The dorsal ramus is carrying sensory information from the skin and skeletal muscles of the back, and the dorsal root of each spinal nerve carries the sensory information up to the spinal cord. So this is the sensory pathway. We're just looking at the motor pathway. This is all the input. Interoreceptors from visceral organs coming through the ramus communicans going to our visceral sensory information. Interoreceptors from the body wall and limbs, again, coming to the visceral sensory nuclei. Uh, Extraroreceptors, proprioreceptors of the back, extra and proprioreceptors of the body wall and limbs, all coming in to the somatic sensory nuclei, all ascending tracks going up to the brain. There they are, broken down for you. Uh, here's a little bit of review. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three little questions. Let's keep going and talk about a nerve plexus. A nerve plexus is an interwoven network of nerves. They're formed during development. Small muscles are innervated by different ventral rami uh, infused to form larger muscles. The muscles infuse forming larger muscles and they basically separate the ventral rami are, are still there. So the ventral rami of adjacent spinal nerves converge and blend their fibers producing these little plexuses. There are four plexuses in the body. Uh, they are the cervical, the brachial, the lumbar, and the sacral. And they basically innervate right where they are. So the cervical plexus is innervating regions of the head, neck, and upper arm. Brachial plexus is our arm. Lumbar plexus is our lower back and leg. Sacral plexus is the pubic region and leg. Pretty, makes, makes sense. So cervical plexus, muscles of neck, skin of neck, superior part of chest, the diaphragm, including the phrenic nerve, which is one of our important nerves in regulating respiration. Here you see some of those nerves involved, and we'll get into all the cranial nerves eventually, but right now we're just focusing on the spinal nerves. Cervical plexus, you don't need to know all the spinal segments and their distribution, all of that, but you should know what the cervical plexus is and that the phrenic nerve is included in that. You can pause the video here and answer these three questions. The brachial plexus innervates the pectoral girdle and upper limbs, and it originates from the trunks and the cords. Um, again, you don't need to know that part. You just need to know what the, where the brachial plexus is. It innervates the arm. Pretty straightforward. Don't need to know any of those. Uh, the cutaneous nerves are distributed throughout the wrist and hands. Yeah, nerve damage can be precisely localized by testing sensory function on the hand. That makes sense. It's pretty uh, straightforward there. So by where on your hand is numb, it's going to dictate your nerve damage. Again, here, you don't need to know all the specific nerves. You don't need to know the specific spinal segments or the distribution. You can pause the video here and answer these three questions. The lumbar and sacral plexuses arise from the lumbar and sacral segments of the spinal cord. They innervate the pelvic girdle, lower limbs. The lumbar plexus just comes from a little bit higher up than the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus contains the sciatic nerve. That's really all you need to know about those two. Sciatic nerve is the biggest and longest nerve in the body. It goes all the way down the leg. And just like in the hands, you can use your numbness and tingling feelings to diagnose nerve problems. You can do the same thing in the feet. And we don't need to know these, we don't need to know these. You can pause the video here and answer these three questions. Learning outcomes for reflexes, already included in your chapter guides. Let's talk about something called a neuronal pole. A neuronal pole is a network of interconnected neurons. So these neurons could involve specific regions of the brain, they could involve specific locations of the brain and or spinal cord. So the number of poles is estimated between a hundred and a couple thousand. So there's lots of neuronal poles. The pattern of interaction is going to give us a clue to how that pole functions. So we have a neural circuit. This is a wiring diagram of neuron interaction. It's a common pattern. It's going to include something like divergence, parallel processing, serial processing, convergence, and reverberation. The brain is where all of these complex neural processes happen. The simplest circuits are going to control our automatic reflexes. So let's look at some of these common patterns. Divergent. Divergent is when the spread of information from one goes from one neuron to several neurons or from one pole to several poles. This is going to allow a broad distribution of whatever the input is. Like an example, sensory input to the central nervous system goes to a neuronal pole through the spinal cord and brain. Right, root is the spinal cord and brain, and then it goes to all of these neuronal poles. Parallel processing is when several neurons or neuronal poles process the same information simultaneously. This requires some type of divergence prior to this process. 
obviously, to get the different pools with the same information. Serial processing is information relayed through a stepwise fashion from one neuron to another neuron to another neuron or one pool to another pool to another pool. This would be when sensory information from one part of the brain is relayed to another part of the brain. Convergence is when several neurons synapse on one single postsynaptic neuron. And so what you have here is motor neurons that can be subject to both conscious and unconscious control. An example would be the voluntary adjustment of normal automatic breathing, right? Our, our autonomic nervous system is controlling our respiration rate, but I can consciously say, hold my breath or take a deep breath. So there's this input, this kind of battle going on or convergence. Reverberation is when collateral branches of axons along the circuit either extend backward towards the source of the impulse or further stimulate that presynaptic membrane or presynaptic neuron. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop where because one's firing, it's going to cause it to do again and then cause it to do again and cause it to do again. Once activated, it will continue to function until fatigue or some inhibitory stimuli breaks the cycle. So here you see divergence, parallel processing, serial processing, convergence, and reverberation in a visual diagram. You can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. So let's get into more specifics about reflexes. Reflexes are rapid, automatic responses to a specific stimulus. They are typically meant to preserve homeostasis by quickly readjusting whatever the situation is. They're very, um, variability in the response. It's always the same response. And the overall process is called a reflex arc. It involves sensory fibers to deliver information from the periphery to the central nervous system and then motor fibers to carry out the motor commands to the peripheral factors. The biggest example is negative feedback, like pulling your hand away from a painful stimulus. The action is in the opposite direction of the stimulus. It's negative feedback, but you're pulling away. So let's look at the steps of the reflex arc. First, you have to have the activation of your receptor. The receptor can be a specialized cell. It can be dendrites of a sensory neuron, et cetera. It can be sensitive to physical or chemical changes in the body or changes in the environment. So leaning on attack, stepping on attack um, will trigger those pain receptors in your hand, um, et cetera. Number two, now that you have a receptor, now you have to activate your sensory neuron. That's going to cause the stimulation of dendrites to produce a graded potential. So that's going to lead to the formation of action potentials along the axons of the sensory neurons involved or connected to that receptor. And that information will arrive through the spinal cord or to the spinal cord through the dorsal root. Then we have information processing that takes place. Information processing begins when that sensory neuron releases excitatory neurotransmitters at the postsynaptic membrane of an interneuron. There's not always an interneuron, but usually there is. Um, this is going to produce an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. This information is then integrated with other stimuli to say, okay, we stepped on attack, or we, we did this, and so this is what we have to do in response. It's this high-level processing that takes place, even though it's not in your brain. It's, it's at the spinal cord level. Very complex. So now that motor neuron has to be activated. Information processing leads to the activation of this motor neuron or motor neurons. They're going to carry the action potential to the periphery. Simultaneously, there's going to be collaterals from that interneuron that may relieve pain sensations up to the brain so that you're now aware that you just stepped on a hot tack, on a tack or on a hot tack, or you touched a hot stove or whatever. So that then you have a response in your peripheral effector. It's going to release neurotransmitters to contract the muscle or pull away or whatever. So here's the whole sequence diagrammed out for you. Activating the receptor with a stimulus. Now we activate our sensory neuron, traveling up to the central nervous system through the dorsal root. Some information is going to go to higher centers in the brain. Otherwise, we're going to activate that motor neuron, stimulate the muscles to contract. Whole process right here. Bing, bang, boom. Just like everything, not all reflexes are the same. We have a variety of reflexes. Some of them are innate. Innate reflexes are ones that ha are you're born with. You don't have any control over them. They, they result from connections that are formed during development. They're genetically and developmentally programmed, and they generally appear in a very predictable sequence. Chewing, sucking, tracking light with your eyes, things like that. Uh, withdrawal from pain. Acquired reflexes or conditioned reflexes are rapid and automated. They can be learned, they're not pre-established, and they're enhanced by repetition. This would be something like catching a ball, right? You can throw a ball at me and I'm probably just gonna go, Ooh, right? I'm a science geek, I'm not a, I'm not a sports person. Um, but if, if I throw it to a, a trained athlete or someone that's used to having a ball thrown at them, they're gonna 
to put their hand up and catch that ball. Then you have the nature of the motor response, which is going to serve as a classification for reflexes. They can be somatic, meaning they deal with your somatic motor, motor um, skeletal muscles, or visceral, which would be with our autonomic reflexes in our smooth muscle glands or adipose tissue. They can also be complex. They can be polysynaptic, meaning there's several synapses along the pathway, or monosynaptic, which would just be the simplest reflex arc, only using one synapse. Usually there's no, there's not even an interneuron involved in those, which means there's minimal delay between the stimulus and the response. They can also be classified by the processing site. So some, most, are processed by your spinal cord. Some of them are processed by your brain, their cranial reflexes. Um, the categories are not mutually exclusive, meaning your reflexes can be both spinal and cranial. So here's just the different classifications. Development, innate or acquired, nature of response, either somatic or visceral, complexity, poly or mono, or processing site in the spine or the cranial. You can pause the video here and go back and answer these three questions. Let's talk about a uh, stretch reflex. This is known as a monosynaptic reflex, so there's only one synapse involved. This is automatically regulating the length of a muscle. The biggest example here is that patellar reflex. The stimulus is an increase in muscle length. So a sensory neuron triggers the immediate motor response. The, the stretched muscle, your patellar tendon is touched, and because your patellar tendon is touched and it stretches your quadriceps muscle, that's going to cause your extensor um, to, to contract. It's going to cause your quadratus muscle to, to contract. So the entire reflex is completed in about 20 to 40 milliseconds. Crazy. The axial potentials are going up to your spinal cord. Processing happens, and the motor commands come right back down in less than half a second. Crazy. So... The steps in this, uh, you have the activation of the receptor by a stimulus, tapping that patellar tendon. Then you have to activate the sensory neuron, those stretch receptors, and stimulate the sensory neurons, action potential generated all the way up to the spinal cord. Information processing happens in the central nervous system. This occurs right at the cell body of the motor neuron. It says, whoa, we, our patellar tendon was stretched. Well, we got to kick our leg out. Uh, now, the activation of the motor neuron can take place, and once that action potential propagates to the peripheral effector, your knee is going to extend in a brief kick. Here's the process. Activation of receptor, activation of sensory neuron, information processing through one synapse, hence monosynaptic reflex, going down to peripheral effector, contracting the effector. So, muscle spindles play a role here in our contractions as well. They're special sensory receptors that are involved in the stretch reflex. They consist of small bundles of skeletal muscle cells called intrafusal muscle fibers. They're not the same thing as your normal contractile muscle fibers. They're basically surrounded by those large muscle fibers, but they're responsible for your resting tone and for contraction of the entire muscle. The gamma motor neuron is innervating each muscle spindle. So it's a special control unit for the muscle spindle. It controls the sensitivity by altering the tension of those intrafusal muscles and allows the central nervous system to increase or decrease muscle tone. There you see the spindle controlled by the gamma motor neuron. So sensory neurons from each intrafusal fiber is always active, which again is responsible for the tone. The impulse frequency changes with the distortion of that intrafusal fiber. So a, stretch, a stretched length is going to stimulate more frequent action, uh, action potentials from that sensory neuron. So it's going to stimulate the motor neurons, leading to increased muscle tone. Um, compressed length is going to inhibit that sensory neuron and reduce the stimulation of the motor neuron, leading to decreased muscle tone. So your muscle spindles are responsible for holding that muscle tone over a long period of time. It's just so that motor neuron doesn't have to keep continuously firing to keep your muscles contracted. There's also postural reflexes. Postural reflexes are a type of stretch reflex. This reflex helps us maintain normal upright position. So when you're standing, that's a reflex. Many muscle groups work in opposite direction or in opposition to one another to maintain the balance over your feet. So it's, you're not just standing there keeping your back muscles straight. You're also flexing your abs. You're also um, adjusting the weight in your ankles. If you've ever paid attention to how you stand in place, you may shift your weight a little bit. That's all reflexology. Not reflexology like the Chinese art of reflexology. I mean reflexology like 
the actual ability of your body to, to produce that type of reflex. Uh, leaning forward is going to stimulate the stretch receptors and the calf muscles, so you're going to pull, pull you back. So these are all postural adjustments, getting your body readjusted so that you can stand. Something as simple as standing. You can pause the video here and answer these three questions. We also have withdrawal reflexes. This would pull your body away from a stimulus. It's usually triggered by a very painful stimuli. It's going to produce a very quick uh, response. It can sometimes be a stimulus from touch or pressure as well. It's very versatile because the sensory receptors activate several interneuron poles, and so the distribution of effects and strength responses uh, can depend on the location and intensity of the stimulus. So the, the withdrawal flat reflex could be like a flexor reflex. This is a type of withdrawal reflex. It affects the muscles of a limb. So painful stimulus, when you accidentally touch something hot, uh, those pain receptors are stimulated, sensory neurons activate the interneurons of your spinal cord, interneurons stimulate the motor neurons of the anterior gray horn, resulting in the contraction of your flexor muscles to yank your hand away from that stove. And then you also have reciprocal inhibition, which keep your extensors relaxed so that you can flex, because if your extensors are contracted and your flexors are contracting, your arm's just going to stay still. So the reflex isn't just in the the flexors, it's also in the extensors to relax them so that your flexors can actually provide a movement. Your extensors are inhibited. So uh, the withdrawal reflexes, again, have a huge variability. Mild discomfort can cause a brief contraction of the muscle of the hand or wrist. More powerful stimuli can produce a more coordinated muscle contraction. There can also be severe pain, uh, which can stimulate you know, your whole body to back away, uh, not just one quick movement. So there's also the crossed extensor reflex. Stretch reflexes and withdrawal reflexes involve ipsilateral reflex arcs, meaning sensory stimulus and motor responses have to occur on the same side of the body. The cross sensor re extensor reflex involves a contralateral reflex arc. The additional motor response is going to occur on the opposite side of the stimulus. So an example of this would be stepping on a tack. Now think about this. You step on a tack and you automatically want to pull your leg up. Well, if you pulled both of your legs up, you would fall down. So the cross extensor reflex is saying, well, I'm going to flex this leg to pull it up and away from this painful stimulus, but I need to keep this other leg down so I don't fall over. That's all the cross extensor reflex is. The flexor pulls the foot away from the affected, the affected foot away from the stimulus, and the cross extensor um, is happening simultaneously. Contralaterals or collaterals of excitatory inhibitory neurons are going to affect the other side of your body, that, that unaffected leg is going to stay straight and not flex because the hurt leg is flexing, right? So here's that cross extensor reflex. On the other side of the body, those extensors are going to be uh, activated. You have polysynaptic reflexes, which are responsible for autonomic actions involving complex movements like walking and running. Uh, they have basic characteristics in common and they typically involve pools of neurons. They are intersegmental in distribution. They can involve reciprocal inhibition. Uh, they can have reverberating circuits, which just, again, that's that positive feedback loop occurring over and over and over again, and they might produce a coordinated and controlled response. You can pause the video here, go back, and answer these three questions. Finally, uh, the uh, reflexes can be used, whoops, I skipped one, sorry. Uh, our brain can have an influence over reflexes. In lab, we'll have a chance to play around with reflexes. Well, guess what? Most of you will not have any reflexes because you know that we're going to lab to test your reflexes. So your brain can kind of override some of the reflexes that are going on. It can either facilitate or inhibit those motor neurons. Um, facilitation is called reinforcement. So in other words, um, this maneuver called the gendrosic maneuver is overemphasizing the patellar reflex. So it's trying to pull apart your hands that are interlocked um, and basically causing that bigger kick to happen. It still produces a very large response even if the person is unaware of the technique. So try to pull your hands apart um, as, your, as that light tap is occurring and you're going to get a, a much bigger kick reaction there. You also have biceps reflex, triceps reflex, and ankle jerk reflex. These are all stretch 
reflexes that are tested during a physical exam, and they're each controlled by specific segments of your spinal cord. So your reflex response is going to provide information about those corresponding spinal segments. Typically, when doctors are testing your reflexes or clinicians are testing your reflexes, they don't tell you. They just kind of, oop, pop you real quick so that they can get your unbiased um, reflex. Babinski reflex can be used in diagnostic testing. Babinski reflex is by stroking the lateral side of the foot. Uh, typically in newborns, the Babinski reflex, when you stroke the lateral side of the foot, newborns will spread apart their toes. But in, an, in a healthy adult that doesn't have brain damage, they are going to squeeze their toes together if you touch the inside of their foot. It's normal in an infant for them to spread it apart, but not normal for an adult to do that. So it, it disappears, that reflex disappears over time. Um, it's also sometimes called the plantar reflex or the negative Babinski reflex. This is when the curling of the toes occurs. And again, as I said, it would be present if there was some type of central nervous system damage in an adult. There's also the abdominal reflex, which this is where a light stroking of the skin is going to produce like a twitch of the abdominal muscles. Um, this depends on the facilitation during the, of those descending tracks, but it's usually seen in normal adults, and the absence of the reflex <coughs> may indicate damage to those tracks. It's lightly touching the abdomen. This chart comes from your book, just goes through some of the diagnostic reflexes. Might be interesting for you to check out. You just have to know the ones that I specifically mentioned here in the lecture. You don't have to know all of these um, in detail. And this is the last set of questions for your review. Please let me know if you have questions as you go through this chapter. I'd love to talk to you about the spinal cord, its anatomy, and its pathways. Um, our next chapter is going to be the brain. And we're going to go into how what happens at that higher level of processing. So have a good day. Let me know if you have questions. Bye.